Uh, thank you uh, for your attendance here today and thank you for uh, Jackson McDonald for hosting this event. Uh, this is uh, the seventh of these forums that we have been involved with um, across the country and um, it's been a very interesting and diverse um, approach that, that the, the audience has taken in, in, um, in hearing from the likes of Anthony and Joe and, and our uh, legal positions. So um, today is really about making sure that you get the opportunity that you want and the information that you want. So we, we encourage you um, to uh, think about what you would like addressed by the panel at the end of the day um, and to note those down. And, um, and also, if there's something that, uh, that, we're, that you would like us to cover, please, please participate in a full and um, structured manner. So you know, what we know is that the aged care providers are facing a very complex um, environment at the moment. The announcement of the Royal Commission into aged care quality and safety has come at a time when we already are dealing with you know, the establishment of the aged care quality and safety commissioner, um, the, the transition to the new single aged care standards, um, the increasing care requirements um, and the focus on clinical governance um, particularly some of the failures in that area from, um, from that perspective. And if we think of the um, results from last year that 45% of providers in the sector uh, were running at a deficit, um, so the financial sustainability of the sector is also a very key um, um, issue on the minds of people involved in the sector. So, um, in terms of uh, you know us selecting the the topic of dignity of risk um, and the associated clinical governance that works with that, um, we felt that this was the area that um, would have the most impact on the quality of life of people involved in the aged care sector, and we felt that it needed um, we needed to as a sector and as a provider to that sector, um, start to really delve into what is going to be required in order for us to realise that um, as, as an important aspect of people um, in aged care environments. Um, so on that basis, I'll now just go straight into the program today. And the first speaker is Anthony Black. He is our Senior Risk Solutions Consultant and our National Care Lead. Uh, Anthony has a, has a long history in the health and human services sector. Um, he did get a bit cross at the last forum because I said I think it was around the 70s or 80s that he commenced and um, he was a little horrified at that. I thought that was nothing to be horrified about but he'll um, tell you why that was of concern to him a little later. So he is a former nurse and he has also progressed through to being a health services executive um, and uh, particularly um, in the aged care sector, he's held some senior executive positions there. He has qualifications in science, nursing, business and gerontology. So uh, certainly um, his experience in his uh, clinical practice um, it demonstrates his absolute passion and, con um, and commitment to the sector and particularly to aged care. So I'd like to now welcome Anthony um, up here to commence the program. So two, good afternoon everyone and uh, two corrections first of all. Um, and mainly with Dana. I did start in the 70s and 80s, but that was primary school and high school, <laughs> just to clarify <laughs> that. Um, and Alex, uh, oh no, and you never nodded, you never stopped being a nurse. Can I just clarify oh, that too? Sorry, I, I think you used the term former nurse, and those of you in the room who are nurses know that there's no such definition as a former nurse. Uh, Alex, wherever you are, happy to challenge you on the definition of risk. Um, and uh, maybe give you some more insight into what I believe is the better definition of risk than we currently read. Um, as Diana pointed out, uh, my role, my everyday job as a consultant is working around this big country, and it is a big country as you get around it, uh, supporting organisations in the care environment, uh, predominantly at the moment in the aged care environment, but uh, my work is uh, starting to also move into the disability sector for obvious reasons as well. And in building this Dignity of Risk Forum a couple of months ago, uh, it was really front of mind to us that the concept of uh, dignity and the concept of governance 
uh, was, was highly challenging. And what we weren't seeing is necessarily uh, disruptors to thought leadership. We see ourselves as a little bit of, those, of that disruptor, and by, by that I mean it was almost as if we we're going to tackle the concept of dignity of risk through the usual challenges or channels of compliance or the way that we've always done things. So we have historical success, that means we're going to have uh, historical success, that means we're going to have future success. And that's, that's certainly not the case. And so this and the series of forums, there's actually been five, I don't know where the other two were, maybe I missed those ones, Diana, but uh, there's been five forums. We've had, over, <laughs> we've had nearly 250 people attend these forums um, over the country, uh, which has been really pleasing and, and they've brought a great richness to the conversation and the thinking around this. I mean, the one objective that we were really hoping to achieve with this is to have people walk away and have a different conversation about dignity of risk. And I hope that that's the case for you here today. should also point out that uh, this is the biggest forum that we have had in Perth. So thank you for your support. And it looks like another premiership's coming the way of the West. Yes. Uh, um, I want to start off with a story. And the story is a true story, and it relates to a uh, conversation meeting I had with care staff in an organisation in Queensland recently uh, where they're actually reviewing their clinical governance uh, and they're incorporating the concept of dignity and risk in that, in that review. So this is a real story about a lady called Anna who came to this facility um, of her own doing. Uh, she had only been there for two weeks and um, she was creating an enormous dilemma for the staff. Uh, now Anna made the decision to come to the residential care facility the nursing home, as I prefer to call it. She made the decision to do that because she could see that uh, she was, if you like, not being able to cope with her ADLs, her mobility wasn't great. She'd recently had a fall in the community. And it's a fairly, it's a regional town, so a lot of people knew about that. So she decided that she'd come to a, to a residential care facility and she, her, her care needs were quite high. She was getting support at home. Uh, the, the challenge for Anna was that uh, she was blind. so. Coming into this new environment was different to someone else who might be coming into the environment. Um, and her mobility, as I said, was deteriorating and failing. So the one key issue for her and the staff, as you might imagine, uh, was that this was creating an enormous environmental challenge. Uh, but moreover, that uh, she was assessed as a high falls risk because of her mobility and her, and her, and her eyesight. And it was from that moment that for Anna and for the staff that the problems commenced. It was almost like a conviction. She'd been convicted of, uh, of being a high falls risk in her environment and that's certainly how the staff were talking about it. So that kick-started the whole chain of controls that we're all familiar with when it comes to being a high falls risk in an environment like this. Anna was told what she could do, Anna was told what she couldn't do and who needed to be around her when uh, she did certain things. Uh, this essentially meant that when she mobilised, she was meant to call someone to mobilise with her. Uh, that's the type of environment that was created for Anna. And this created a lot of unhappiness for her. And it particularly became unhappy for her when it escalated to the requirement for Anna to ask for someone to accompany her when she went to the toilet. So just think about that for a moment, because in my mind, your dignity is most stripped when two things happen to you in your life. One, when you have to be fed by someone else, and two, when you need someone else to help you to go to the toilet. So this was problematic for Anna, and in fact Anna refused to wait for anyone, to call for anyone, uh, and this created the enormous tension that we were talking about. Staff were saying that they were witnessing her struggling, uh, that one staff mentioned that uh, she'd walked into a door, uh, and the staff at night were really concerned because she was getting up by herself. Um, it was unacceptable. These were the words that were used to me and it was very hard to watch someone who potentially was going to harm themselves. We were discussing this, as I mentioned, in the context of dignity of risk and risk taking in their organisation and what that meant, what that meant for the residents and what it meant for the staff. But I want to share the comment that really stuck with me at the end of the conversation uh, with, a, care, with a, a personal carer and it was backed up by the staff who were sitting there nodding. Um, and this was the direct quote. I'm all for choice and everything, but what she is doing to herself and to us is just not right. So for me, that raised the whole concept of, well, 
Right is an interesting concept in, its, in itself. Um, what is right? Who is right? And whose rights are we actually talking about? The right to decide and the right to take risks, uh, to have choice, uh, is fundamental to us being human beings. So the concept of dignity of risk is a difficult concept to grapple with. It's difficult to engage with. There's no set rules here for dignity of risk. We are being called upon to challenge boundaries and to take on dignity of risk very carefully. And moreover, we have a rising wave of expectations from our community to get this right. And for all of us sitting in this room, the expectation is that it's right before we get there. So we established this forum on the basis that times are challenging, but this needs to be part of the challenging conversations of the aged care environment. Morally, we can't sit around waiting for someone else to fix this. Uh, and this sort of concept that we're talking about at the moment is a window into the future of the types of discussions boards, owners, executives will need to be having. This is just the window into the future. And as I've said quite frequently now, this is a changing paradigm for governance and particularly for aged care. We are being asked to be different. Nothing I see, I work with, I read, I experience says just keep it the same. This is a new paradigm for governance and we're being asked to be different. So what we're offering today, I guess, is a spirit of collaboration. Um, no one person that will present to you today believes that they're the expert on this. We just bring something to the table. We call upon you as you leave the room to take away something that you can have a conversation with someone else about. And we'll all bring different aspects to this. This is a very human topic. Uh, and our objective from the very start has, to be, has been to reshape the conversations and to continue to learn and grow from each other as we go through it. Uh, it's our experience so far that um, this approach to discussing or rethinking or in engaging with dignity of risk is done well in tackling it through three elements. So this is experiential advice at the moment. There are organisations that have picked this up to start the conversation, to start the approach or to embed the approach. And that's what we'll be doing today. We'll be discussing it from the element of knowledge, and I want to share with you some of the concepts of dignity of risk. Joe Ibrahim, who is here, will be talking to you from the perspectives of empathy, and um, Liz will be talking to you about the approach that organisations can take from an advocacy perspective. So, can you imagine thinking about your weekend coming up, can you imagine for a moment when your risks are up for review, where you have to bargain them or negotiate them? Think about your weekend because the chances are if you're reliant on someone else to help you to exist or to live or to get the best out of life, this is the everyday consideration for them. Uh, some of their risks have been completely eliminated. For Anna, it would have felt like her risk of being able to mobilise independently and go to the toilet, which she had been doing in her own home, had to now stop. Um, some are transferred to others and sometimes there's no choice provided to individuals at all. So the dignity of risk concept is a human right element of our duty of care. And there's another piece of work in its own right about what is that balance between dignity of risk and duty of care, something that we'll continue to explore. The, uh, the def this is a definition of dignity of risk. I want to just ask you to have a read of this definition for a moment. It is not the definition, it is a definition and that's helped me to consider dignity of risk from this perspective. You may have your own perspective on it, as individuals we will. But it is important to explore what is the concept of dignity of risk. And for me, as a risk professional as well, I've considered the term dignity of risk. 
uh, Alex, which is what I was referring to earlier on. Because if you take the definition of risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives, in its truest sense, risk is actually about achieving something. It's about identifying uncertainty so that you can, to you, and managing uncertainty, or the effect of uncertainty, so you can achieve something. So it's about making decisions. The dignity of risk, if you even just consider the definition of <coughs> risk, as opposed to the frequently referred to definition of something bad happening, it's actually about helping people to make decisions to do something, to achieve something. So in that sense, we're also being called upon to reframe what we understand the word risk to be. And listen, as a risk professional who deals in this world frequently, that is a lot of my work, redefining what risk is, particularly in the health or care environment where traditionally risk has been considered bad. So dignity of risk is actually about helping people to make decisions, to decide. They get the choice. They get to make the decision to achieve something that they want. This is not a new concept. It's been discussed and talked about for quite some time. It's been in the Aged Care Act since 1997. Yet we are at a time where we are reviewing the concept of dignity of risk because the reality is it's probably something that hasn't existed well in the paternalistic environment in which aged care is operated. And I can say that. I've practised it myself. I've experienced it myself. It is highly paternalistic. And it is counter to the concept of dignity of risk. Uh, it was discussed, Joe's even up there. It was, has been discussed now for some time. Um, it's been discussed even as early as the early 70s. Diana, when I was obviously working as yes. a <laughs> practitioner. I was talking about that long ago, you see. But no, it is written about um, in intellectual disability environments, the concept of dignity of risk was raised as a concept a, a very long time ago. So this is not a new concept. And certainly choice in life and taking risk is not a, is not a new concept. But we're starting to see forces bringing it to life. And for many of you here who are familiar with the new aged care standards, it's, it's, it's quite explicit. Um, it brings to life the requirement that individuals, uh, the consumers, that word that grates me to some extent, that they have the right to, to take risk. On the other hand, the expectation of Standard 8 is that as an organisation, you need to manage risk very well. So in many ways, we've got conflicting messages about preventing harm, allow people to take risk, prevent harm, manage your organisational risk. So it's wrapped up in a little bit of a confused state. Nonetheless, we need to get the best out of this. And we can't become slaves of regulation and moaners about standards when we know that these standards are better than what we've seen in the, in the past. So it's our opportunity to utilise the standards in a different way. Now I want to reflect on uh, a little bit of where this concept has come from from a professional perspective. And no, this is no laughing matter. Um, but yes, as I, as I was introduced, I, I was a nurse. And the, the reason the message I have here is that this is deeply embedded in you. The concept of duty of care is embedded in you as a profession in a way that you may not realise it. So the concept of duty of care, duty of care is very much about protecting your profession. It's about doing right, often for the profession. And risk, as I've said, is this, has been this concept that we must prevent risk from occurring. It is all bad. If you have a look at our clinical risk assessment environment, it's all about mitigating risk, eliminating risk, reducing risk to its lowest point, as low as reasonably possible. When you are reducing risk to as low as reasonably possible for Anna, you're eliminating risk from her life, you're eliminating the human element of Anna. I've had the conversations about this with a number of health professionals about why we grew up in this environment where risk was considered so bad, the duty of care was about our profession. And people really struggle with this concept of dignity of risk. That's been described to me by a physio recently as the paradox, dignity of risk. I'm not quite sure how the two of them can come possibly together and work well when we work in a highly regulated environment where if we do anything wrong, um, we'll either be um, 
sanctioned by a regulator or professionally will have to confront um, the issues. But I think about, you know, just elements of professional practice. It wasn't that long ago where I was a practicing nurse where we would strap people into chairs. And we thought that that was the right thing to do to help manage risk. That we would give um, psychotropic medications at four o'clock in the afternoon. Because we thought that was a good way of stopping people from wandering. You know, so these are deeply embedded. The message here is do not underestimate how strongly part of the culture risk mitigation is, as low as reasonably possible. Eliminating risk is in the environments in which you operate. Don't become blindsided that dignity of risk is an easy concept if we talk about it and encourage it because it's deeply rooted <coughs> into the health professional's psyche. The other element to this was my, a very personal element. Both my parents uh, lived for a short time and died in residential care. And the message I have here is, and this was 10 years ago, the message I have here is that even an educated person like myself struggled with the system. My, my parents who, you know, their disease process diminished them, but so did the system. And I allowed that to happen because I thought that was the right thing to do. So it was so deeply embedded in me and so did my family. We weren't given choice about mum and, dad, mum and dad's risks. Dad, mum and dad's risk had to fit with the program of risk in the organisation. Uh, and, you know, these were risk takers in their life. My dad started a business on the back of nothing. My mum had eight kids. I mean, they're risk takers. <laughs> yeah, when they... <laughs> one of them was me, me so that's, that's a big uh, But, you know, I'm talking about that... But when they went into that residential care facility, life was completely different. My mum was a great tea drinker. So tea was more than just the cup of tea. It was the whole you know, bringing people together, getting a few people around to have a cup of tea. And she go for, through all this process of making tea. And she loved it. Mum's swallowing was deteriorating. And she did aspirate a little bit. And I remember her having a chest infection. When she came to the nursing home and she was assessed by a speech pathologist as, as having that deficit, my mum never had a cup of tea again in her life. That was the reality. And no one, and I supported that because, of course, that's the right thing to do. And that, that, so that's deeply entrenched in, in, in the way that uh, we perceive that paternalistic environment. You know best. So we'll often follow, follow that, even if it does mean diminishing um, our existence. As, as part of my role as a health executive, I was involved in a case called BWV. And those of you from Victoria <laughs> might remember this, bro. Um, as a, an important change in... Yeah, a, an important change in the Medical Treatment Act in Victoria because what was happening was that we had a lady who was significantly diminishing because of her dementia. She had relatively no brain activity but she was being fed by a peg tube and at that point in time that was considered requirement under, under palliative care under the Act. Um, their family advocated against that and the public advocate fought in the Supreme Court to have that changed so that uh, this actually uh, meant that the peg feeding became medical treatment. And as a, as a consequence of that, the family were able to withdraw medical treatment and within six days, BWV, they were her initials, passed away. So this was within a nursing home under my watch. And at, at that time, there were no guidelines, no thoughts about how you deal with something like this. My point, was th my point with this is that we will confront times with dignity of risk which are extremely uncomfortable and that it will polarise your team. Morally and ethically, this polarised my team for about two years. Anyone that came in with a peg tube was just like petrol to a flame. What are we going to have to go through with this again? Don't underestimate the power of accepting the dignity of risk means that it's going to be challenging for your staff. The other aspects to this I just wanted to share because it might enlighten, well, enlighten me sometimes that, you know, we went from, um, we went to ACFI from RCS and it was hoping to be almost like the panacea and it, and it wasn't. All we've seen with ACFI is that it incentivises dependency. It works against the concept of dignity of risk in my mind, um, which is rather unfortunate. And also that... Did you flick that open then or did I? Oh. I think you did. And, <laughs> and also that... Um, we, I, I just had listed there the Charter of Rights. Charter of Rights from 15 years ago talked about dignity of risk. So we still keep issuing charters of rights it's getting people now to sign them, sit there with them, but really what are we doing with the concept of dignity of risk, given that it's been three successive charters of rights? 
This is not an isolated challenge, it's highly dependent. And I've talked about this to boards and executives. Don't believe that this can be done separately to your business. It relies on three things working really well, steadily together, and these are the three things. You've got to have a real and true and authentic approach to consumer involvement. Boards need to be able to demonstrate that they can govern for vulnerable people. And maybe that means for some boards that, re, that, that re, reinvigorates their board. Or maybe it means it changes their board. But directors need to be really clear about their responsibility to this concept and it must be led. And it can't be led by managers and care providers as it has been the expectation in the past. And clinical governance, I'd have to say for a, a lot of organisations I walked, uh, work with, clinical governance, organisations are still sprinting to the start. And there is so much work to be done with clinical governance to get this right. And using dignity of risk to rethink your clinical governance is actually a good way of considering it. Do you really push clinical risk so hard, so low to as reasonably possible, that you eliminate the ability of anyone to take a risk? Think about Anna the next time you think about what you've done in terms of assessing somebody as a high falls risk. It's like a conviction, and it's often never a spent conviction. And the standards are telling us to do something about it. The standards are there, but we shouldn't be using the standards to be generating a change in approach to dignity of risk. We've got to get these three things right. Being compliant, in my mind, is just a race to the bottom. It's about meeting a minimum standard. And if we're prepared as a society to celebrate that we've met a minimum standard, then I'm not sure that's a good reflection on who we are. It's got to be more than that. I've been calling on organisations not just to manage this, but to reimagine it. Do something different. We're being called upon to do something different, and it's important that we do something about that. In many ways, this is about striking the balance, is it not? It's striking the balance to our organisational duties to our duty to loyalty, that is the best interests of people, our duty to obedience, that is our necessity to be compliant to regulation and law, and our duty to care uh, to those we exist for. But what I suggest we need to be focusing on for the concept of dignity of risk as well is our duty to dignity. Uh, in my mind, it's a shift from just focusing on those duties that I talked about organisationally to what I believe is the moral bedrock of getting this right. Dignity of risk should be our moral bedrock. It's about helping people to have the right to take decisions, to make decisions and to have choice. Um, I want to leave you with something. Are you familiar with Barney Cooney? Barney was a senator, an Australian senator. He's actually a senator of the Labor Party, but for most people who walk the corridors of Parliament, they would not know which side of politics Barney was on because he was an issues politician who worked for his community, very strong-minded. At his funeral, you know, both sides of politics attended, but Barney was in a residential care facility, a nursing home. So isn't it funny that we've gone from residents in nursing homes to consumers in facilities? Language is powerful. Think about that one. But Barney was in a nursing home. That's where he spent the, the last parts of his life, um, which was a challenge for Barney. It's such, an, uh, such a, a, a broad-minded, big thinker. Um, he really felt the, the, the challenge of losing his dignity of risk. And he wrote to the Royal Commission. So in Perth, I think it may have been, the hearing in Perth, it was read out on the Friday of, of, the, of the hearing his submission to the Royal Commission. But I want to raise, I just want to read to you this part of, of his submission. I'm not being over dramatic when I state that I sit here slowly dying. It is a process that is neither physically comfortable nor emotionally easy to cope with, but I'm not dead yet, and I've not given up on life. I'm not alone in this experience, as there are others in this home and thousands across the country who share it, uh, and I want our position understood. There must be recognition and support to assist us as we struggle to maintain our human dignity and involvement in life when, in consequence of our physical circumstances and diminishing personal autonomy, it is constantly being stripped from us. Some powerful messages from someone who lived the experience of it. And the thing about Barney that he is re renowned for in the way that he operated was to always finish off a discussion with, so what are you going to do about it? And that's the message that I would like to pass on from Barney to you today, is what are you going to do about this? 
so are you here uh, reflecting on a problem? Is that the reason that you've come here? Or are you prepared to have a, a different conversation with someone who may not even be in aged care? Because this is a community issue as much as it is an aged care issue. Are you prepared to have a different conversation about this and recognise it? When we put together this forum, we wanted to do something different, which is the reason that I invited Professor Joe Ibrahim to work with us. Uh, Joe will be well known to many of you. I've worked with Joe in different ways over the, over the years. Um, he's a practising senior medical specialist, a geriatrician. He's a researcher and he heads law and ageing through Monash University. His work has been well published and well recognised in terms of quality of clinical care, quality of aged care and in patient safety environments. And he's been a strong advocate for dignity of risk around this country. Um, he's produced a movie, so now he's a movie star, um, and he's producing more movies, um, but he's frequently called upon to give advice or evidence in forums. In fact, this week, he spent earlier this week uh, at the Federal Parliament Joint Committee hearing on human rights uh, to give advice to that committee. Uh, and you'll be aware that in the Royal Commission, Joe was asked to be a witness, and after two hours um, of questions, uh, the Commissioner, Commissioner Tracy, said what Australia needs is more Professor Ibrahims. Um, and certainly, yes, that is the case, but today we have the one and only. Um, <laughs> I'd, like, <laughs> I'd like to thank you for allowing me to share my stories with you today. Uh, I encourage you to share your stories. Uh, storytelling is a very powerful medium and it re it's a human medium and a concept like Dog Dignity of Risk is calling upon us to, to do this in a different way. Uh, but enough of that, thank you very much for listening to me and I'd like to hand it over to Joe Ibrahim.